So I think without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce um, Deborah Hamilton, um, who is the Strategic Services Librarian, and she does the law collection for the Pikes Peak Library District. So Deborah. Great. Thanks, Christine. And thanks, everyone, for being here with us today. Um, as Christine mentioned, my name is Deborah Hamilton. I am the Strategic Services Librarian uh, that is in charge of the law collection at Pikes Peak Library District. So we're down in Colorado Springs. Um, my email is listed there on the first slide, and I'll have it listed again um, on the you know, final slide. Um, but please feel free to reach out to me if you have any follow-up questions after this webinar, if you encounter a legal reference question you're working on and just want to bounce some ideas off me, I'm more than happy to help. Um, I am also this year president of the Colorado Association of Law Libraries. And so we are putting on this three-part webinar, webinar series. Um, our goal is to kind of help demystify legal reference. Um, I think sometimes people get a little bit nervous when they encounter patrons with law questions. Um, so we're here just to help provide some support, give you some strategies, as well as point out some resources. So this session, we're really just going to talk about some of the basics of legal reference, um, and we'll talk a little bit about finding forms and making referrals to services out in the community at the very end. Um, and then you can, um, in the next two months, though, we'll have the two other webinars. So on Wednesday, March 27th, Kesley Kant, uh, she's a librarian at Davis, Graham, and Stubbs, a law firm in Denver. She is going to be presenting on state resources and local law resources. Um, so she'll be looking more a little bit at where to find the law online for free. And then on Thursday, April 25th, Michelle Macias, who is a librarian with the Department of Justice, she um, is going to be taking a look then at federal resources as well as um, secondary sources that help sort of explain the law. But let's go ahead and dive in to um, this webinar. And so here's just kind of a brief overview of what we're going to be covering today. Um, you know, as you have questions, please place any of them in the chat window. I'm going to pause a few times during the webinar just to make sure we don't have any questions. And then anything that doesn't get answered during the webinar, we'll make sure um, to get to uh, at the end of the presentation. Um, but go ahead and just pop those in the chat window as you think of them so you don't forget them. Okay, so first we're going to review some of the basic concepts of legal research. And so we'll begin by discussing what is the purpose of legal research, so what is the goal for the patron in all of this. This will follow up with a review of how government works and what laws get created, um, just so you have a little bit of sense of what the lay of the land is. Um, then we'll discuss uh, these concepts of authority and currency because um, they play a big part in making sure um, patrons are finding the correct information. Uh, and then we'll wrap up with a review of um, what citations look like. So that way you kind of have a sense of if someone actually does come in with a citation, what it is that they're asking for. So the purpose of legal research is really going to depend on who the user is. And generally we see four different categories of user. We have a lay user, um, expert, pro se, and then self-represented litigants. Those last two categories, um, the pro se and the self-represented litigants, um, sometimes you'll see that term pro se can be used for both. Um, but there are some distinctions between those two user types. But the lay user is generally going to have a casual interest in the law. It might be a student working on an assignment, or it might be a person that's heard about a law or a case and is interested in learning more. Um, this type of user tends to be fairly easy to work with since there's really less at stake here. Then next, you may have some expert users. Uh, these tend to be attorneys or other legal professionals. Generally, um, I myself don't interact a lot with this type of user very often since um, these types are usually more familiar with how to do legal research. So usually it's only, again, on kind of those really hard to track down things that I might actually be interacting with an attorney or a paralegal. Um, again, there's kind of less at stake with working with those types of patrons. Uh, the last two categories, though, they're pretty closely related. Um, both the pro se and the self-represented litigant, they're acting in their own legal interests. 
Um, and so that is the purpose of why they're coming to the library to do legal research. Pro se is a broader term. That just refers to someone who is acting in their own interest. A pro se patron may be looking to draft their own will or write a lease to rent property that they have. Um, whereas a self-represented litigant, they're acting in their own legal interest, but they're also going to be appearing in court to defend that interest. Um, so again, as I said, that term pro se will sometimes be applied to both, but the main difference with those self-represented litigants is that in addition to needing to know the substantive law about the topic area that their legal issue falls into, they're also going to need to know about the procedural laws for appearing in court. So most of our discussion today, we're really going to focus on working with these last two categories of patrons, the pro se's and the self-represented litigants, since primarily that is who you'll encounter um, looking for legal information at the library. <clears throat> so for those pro se patrons, um, the purpose of their legal research is to find what's referred to as binding primary authority um, that applies to the particular legal situation at hand. Um, as I mentioned before, the self-represented litigants will then have a second area to research in addition to their topic area, which will be the court procedures um, for the specific court that they're appearing in. Um, we will discuss in detail what that binding primary authority means, um, so just hold tight for that. That statement will make more sense here in a couple of slides. So then the goal for us as librarians is slightly different than the goal for the patron. Um, we are going to be much more focused on the process rather than the answer in these types of questions. Um, so we were really process oriented when working with patrons uh, with legal questions. Our goal then is to help the patron navigate uh, legal research on their own. So we're not necessarily turning up a definitive answer for the person, um, but we're helping them to locate sources and explaining how to go through the research process so they, they can then find the answers on their own. So generally, I like to begin by thinking what kind of source might have the answer rather than what is the answer to the question. So in order to take that approach, though, um, it helps if you have a basic understanding of the various levels of government and how laws are created. That way you'll have a broad sense of where to look for certain types of law. Um, the first thing we want to keep in mind is that we have multiple jurisdictions that create law. And so jurisdiction is important um, in that it is what makes the authority of the law binding to a situation. Um, so California laws don't apply to uh, Colorado, for example. Um, and so I kind of have my slide here flipped upside down, um, but at the top level we have federal jurisdiction. And so um, common topics that you might encounter at the library that would involve federal law might be things like bankruptcy, uh, copyright, employment dis discrimination, or possibly things dealing with the American with Disabilities Act. Then next, each of the 50 states have their own governments separate from the federal government. Um, and so topics that you might see in um, state jurisdiction would be divorce, landlord-tenant, um, things regarding wills and estates or after someone has passed away going through the probate process, um, contracts, torts. Um, torts you know, refers to kind of when harm has been done between individuals, acts of negligence, things like that. And then we have local jurisdictions that also create laws. So this is going to be your city council or, um, you know, your county commissioners. And so this is going to include topics, you know, like your neighbor's barking dog or where can you put that fence in your yard or sometimes minor traffic crimes or traffic infractions, excuse me, or minor crimes like shoplifting. So within both the federal and state governments, we have three branches of government, all which issue laws to varying degrees. Most commonly when we think about the creation of laws, we tend to think about the legislative branch, since this is really, really where the process begins. Um, Congress will create legislation that then becomes law when signed by the president or the governor. 
after legislation is passed and becomes law, then it goes through a process called codification, where it gets organized by topic. And then these laws will generally then now be referred to as statutes, or in the case of Colorado, revised statutes, and in the case of the federal government, codes. Um, so Colorado has the Colorado revised statutes, federal government, we have the US code. Um, the names for state statutes will sometimes vary. Um, so if you are located in a different state, your state laws may be called something a little bit different. So then the job of the executive branch is to execute the laws passed by the legislative branch. So primarily these laws are going to be referred to as rules and regulations. And they are written by the various government agencies. Agencies, though, need an enabling statutory authority before they can formulate a regulation. They can't just make regulations on their own. Um, so the legislative branch decides what should be done, and then the executive branch decides how it should be done. As new regulations are being approved and put out there, they will be published in documents that are called registers. Um, the Federal Register gets published every day. The Colorado Register gets published um, about every other week. And then eventually, these things will also get codified and organized by topic as well. Then our final branch of government, the judicial branch, um, the courts, uh, what they do is apply the law. So the judicial branch, um, produces laws through the judge's decisions, and that is what is then known as case law. Um, a couple of things to note here, though, with what comes out of the judicial branch. Not all cases make up the law because they don't necessarily change legal precedent, and not all cases will be published. Um, so the cases that do get published, they're always going to be coming out of appeals level courts and higher. Um, and then depending on the state that you're in, some states only publish the decisions at that appeals level and higher that actually set legal precedent. So let's say there's a high profile legal case in your town or a court case in your town. If it's still at the trial level, it's not going to be published and available at any law library. Generally, those trial level cases, you may be able to obtain a transcript from the court that they occur at. But generally, there are, fine, or are fees associated with retrieving them, and sometimes they can be really hard to track down. Um, the other type of law that comes out of the judicial branch are what is known as the court rules. And so these are the laws that dictate the procedure of the courts. And usually, each court, be it civil, criminal, probate, et cetera, they have their own set of rules for how things get done in that particular court. Generally, you're going to find these court rules with the statutes or the code, depending on the jurisdiction that that court serves. So for example, with the Colorado Revised Statutes, if you have a print set, it's going to be the final two volumes. You'll have two volumes just of court rules for the state of Colorado. Um, or if you're on the free Colorado Revised Statutes website, there is a place where you can locate the court rules there. So if you do have a patron who is representing themselves in court, um, you want to you know, make sure that they are aware of these court rules. Um, and it can give them a lot of guidance in terms of what forms they need to file, in what order they should be doing that, how does evidence get presented, um, what's the timeline that they need to use. So there's a lot of really useful information in those court rules. <clears throat> Um, if you have a second in the chat, um, if you want to list maybe some of the types of common law questions that you get at your locations, um, that would be kind of useful for me to see. Generally, I tend to field a lot of state questions, but I'm just sort of curious in terms of what other kinds of issues people are encountering out there from patrons with legal questions. So I see a few folks typing, so I'm just going to kind of circle back around here to my script. So by and large, most of the questions that I get tend to focus on matters that are of state law, and I see that's what Samantha has listed there as well. Um, so again, that covers a lot of kind of your big topics, I think, that people have legal issues in. So divorce is, you know, probably our biggest area that we field questions in, particularly finding forms for divorce, things like that. Yes, and forms, that is another thing that comes up quite a bit. Yeah, and I see a lot of similar things that I encounter as well. 
Um, immigration, yeah, that can also be a big issue as well, and that's going to be a matter of federal jurisdiction. Um, and so, you know, if you're only going to really focus on one resource, for me, you know, I always tell staff that, you know, learning kind of the basics about the state statutes um, is generally what most people are coming in to look, um, look for. Every now and again, you're going to get patrons who need case law or other things. Um, and very rarely, though, do I get questions that actually deal with, uh, with uh, regulations, but that does happen from time to time. But I think finding forms and knowing your state statutes, um, those are two things that, you know, a pretty discrete tasks that you can learn, um, and that will actually help you with a lot of the questions I think you'll encounter. <clears throat> so authority then is another concept that we want to be familiar with, uh, and there's really two components to it. Uh, the first is the notion of primary versus secondary authority. So primary authority, that's going to be the law itself. And then secondary authority, these are the sources that explain the law. Um, and so if anyone has ideas about where they might find secondary sources, go ahead and feel free to pop that into the chat. Um, but those secondary sources, they're going to include a lot of different types of things. Um, you know, things like encyclopedias, treatises, law review articles. Um, a lot of times in public libraries, you're going to see NOLO books. Um, that's kind of a great uh, secondary source that's really geared towards a layperson audience. Um, secondary authority is not something that would you would want to cite in a court document. Um, you would want to use the primary authority for that type of thing. But the secondary authorities can be immensely useful in a number of ways. So first, they can help to explain complex legal topics. So we, while we as librarians can't interpret the law for our patrons, secondary sources may be able to provide some of those answers. And the second way that secondary sources can be really important is that they can lead you to the relevant primary law. So rather than the patron trying to determine if this or that is the relevant statute or case that they should be citing, a legal expert or a panel of experts that's written the secondary source have made that determination already. Um, and sometimes those secondary sources can also um, point you to the correct forms as well. The other type of authority uh, that we want to be aware of is this idea of binding versus persuasive. And so this is going to be really a matter of jurisdiction. So again, the binding authority is the primary law for the jurisdiction where the legal matter is taking place. So again, California law is not going to be binding in Colorado. It might be persuasive, but again, it's not, um, it's not actually, it doesn't have authority over that particular jurisdiction. And Deb, can I interrupt you real quick? Um, Kelsey had a question that I don't know if it makes sense to answer now or later or if you have an idea, but she um, said a patron had an online request um, looking for a legal paper from a court case, and she has a court case number. Hmm. Um, so if she has that court case number, she may be able to then contact the court where that case was at. Generally, if you get materials from the courts themselves, there are fee associate, associated with getting that. But if it's not the case itself, but some other type of motion or something like that, those, again, can be difficult to track down. So I would first try um, the court of record where that case is from, especially since she has that number. Um, they may be able to retrieve that particular document for her. Um, or you could also see if um, some of the larger law libraries like CU Boulder, they may subscribe to databases that would include things like motions and pleadings and things like that. I myself don't have those kinds of documents in my collection, but one of those larger law libraries may. So I hope that helps. Yeah, those are usually like the hardest things to track down are sort of those ancillary documents that aren't necessarily the law itself, but they're sort of a piece of that larger picture. So good luck to you, yeah. But um, I would first try the court, especially if she has the number. That makes things a lot easier. Oh, okay. perfect. Thanks, Deb. Yeah, no problem. All right, so next up, we want to talk a little bit about currency. Um, and so you, what you want to, you want to make sure what you're using is current. 
Um, the only exception to this might be is if you have a patron who's working on an appeals case, then they may need to see what the law was in 2009 or whenever the incident occurred. Generally, though, you're not going to meet a lot of pro se's who are working on appeals cases, but they are out there. Usually by that time, though, they're familiar enough with the legal system to ask for the year in question. So if they need an older statute, they'll be asking for that particular year. Um, it's also helpful um, when thinking about currency, um, especially if you're dealing with uh, the revised statutes in print, it's helpful to know what the state's legislative session is. So generally, there's a period in time where there are new laws that have been passed, but the print books don't get published for a few more months. So if you do subscribe to the Colorado Revised Statutes in print, um, then generally you're going to get an update at the end of the legislation with what are called the session laws. So all the laws that were passed during that year's legislative session. In Colorado, this book is just known as the Red Book. Um, if you don't have a print set, though, generally you can go on to the General Assembly's website um, and you can see if a law has been amended or repealed um, through their website as well. Um, with case law, uh, it's going to be published in chronological order if you're using print resources. Um, and sometimes even online when you find cases through a court's website or somewhere else, um, it can be very difficult to tell if there's been a later case that has overturned the case you're looking for. So with case law, um, it's really important that you have access to what's called a citator service. And there's sort of two main ones that are out there. Uh, there's Keysight from Westlaw, and then there's Shepard Citation, which is a LexisNexis product. Generally, unfortunately, though, these tools are usually only found at law libraries. Um, it's pretty expensive um, to have one of these tools. So I would recommend, if you have a patron that's doing in-depth case law research for a pro se matter, then it's really, that's a really good time to refer them to a law library. And if they have the citations already, it can just be a matter of, you know, shooting me an email and asking to see if there's, you know, any flags on the case that it's been overturned. It just takes me a matter of seconds to put it in the database and you can tell right away if it's still good law or not. Um, so I'm always happy to take those kinds of referrals. Um, it really doesn't take that long to check and the patron doesn't even necessarily need to come into the law library to get answers for that. Okay, and I do see um, another question here about the Denver Municipal Code for um, older sources. I would see if you're, um, if I'm assuming Denver probably has a city archives, so I would check there, or your city clerk um, may also maintain those older municipal codes. So those would be the two places that I would look. Um, and DPL, I know they have that, uh, their, their special collections may also collect that. Um, so that may be a third place to look. Okay, moving right along to citation formats. I just want to show you a few of these. I don't think you need to go and memorize these citation formats, but it is kind of helpful to know generally what they look like. So if you do encounter them, um, either from a patron or if you're using a secondary source, you sort of know what they're referring to. So the first up are just some sample citations for statutes and codes. Um, generally, legal citations have kind of all of the same parts. They might just be ordered a little bit differently. Um, so with the federal citation there on the top, it's going to start with a title number. Titles are just a topic area. So in this case, Title 18 um, is the, the topic area for criminal laws. Then next you have a name of the source that's going to be abbreviated. So in this one it's um, USC, which is just going to stand for US code. Then you'll have a section number, so that kind of double S, that's just a, the symbol for a section. And so you have the section number, and then sometimes you'll have a year after it. A lot of times you won't, but you may occasionally see that that year after the citation. So that would be a case where you needed to find an older version of the law rather than the current one. But a lot of times that year in parentheses will be omitted. Then the state statute, it's all the same parts, but um, 
it's, you know, it's just kind of in a different order. And so this one, the Colorado Revised Statutes, it starts with the abbreviation for the title of the source. So that's what CRS stands for, it's Colorado Revised Statutes. Then you have your title number. So this time it's uh, Title 42, which is going to cover um, vehicle and traffic laws. Then you have a section number followed by an article number. The next up are the citation formats that you might encounter for court cases. Sometimes you'll get the full citation. Other times you may just see a part of it. Um, so you may have just the party names in a year. That might be a portion that you would see. Or that very bottom one, um, 74P3D, a lot of times if you have a partial citation, that's what it's going to look like. Um, but a full citation, as you can see there at the top, you have your plaintiff versus the defendant. And then you're going to have the volume number for the reporter that the case is in. And so cases get published in these books that are called reporter. And so then that reporter code after that is the federal reporter, the second edition, and then it's followed up by the page number. If it's a fully complete citation, then it may even tell you the court where the case was heard in the year. So in that top example, it would be the Tenth Circuit uh, Federal Court. That's the one that Colorado's a part of and the year was 1993. And then there's just a second example down there. That would be a state court case. And so this one, I can tell by the code, it's in volume 441 of the Southeast Reporter, second edition, and you would find it on page 433. <clears throat> so a case um, is usually reported in more than one reporter. So they may have what are known as parallel citations. So you might have two of those coded parts that would still refer you to the exact same case. And then lastly is um, citation format for regulations. It has similar components um, to the citation for statutes and codes. So again, it's just knowing sort of what some of those abbreviations are. And so here I just have one example of the, um, from the Code of Federal Regulations. That's what the CFR stands for. But again, you have your title number, the code, and then the section number. And then CCR, that's going to be the abbreviation for the Colorado Code of Regulations. So you may see that um, here. But again, I, I still get very few questions on regulations. By and large, most people are interested in finding statutes, and then after that, cases. Um, regulations tend to get little play in the law library. Um, let's see, we've answered a few questions. I just wanted to pause before we move into the next section to make sure we don't have any lingering questions out there. If you do, go ahead and just pop them in the chat. We'll make sure to get them. Um, but if not, I'm going to move forward then to talking about the legal reference interview next. And so we're just going to kind of go through the process of doing a legal reference interview here. Um, and so first, um, I just want to discuss the purpose of the interview. Then we'll talk a little bit about the pathway for what your interview might look like. Uh, then I want to discuss a little bit about the unauthorized practice of law and some other things to keep in mind when working with patrons with legal reference questions. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about this difference between legal information and legal advice, and hopefully that will make it easy to understand how you can avoid the unauthorized practice of law. And then I'd like to just wrap up with a few other things to kind of keep in mind. So the purpose in a legal reference interview, let me switch slides, sorry. Um, the purpose in the legal reference interview is slightly different than a regular reference interview. I feel like the legal reference interview, again, is much more process oriented. So you're really um, instructing the patron in how to do their own research rather than just pulling up an answer for them. Um, if they come in with a direct citation, then by all means, if you're able to pull up that one, you know, sort of known item document, by all means, go ahead and do that. But if something where they're not really quite sure where in the law they should be looking, you kind of want to go through this process to instruct them how to do their own research. Um, so first, what we're trying to do is to help make patrons aware of the sources that are available and then how to use those sources. 
Um, I really like to try and put the onus of selecting sources on the patron, if at all possible. Um, so I always like to give people choices. So asking them things like, do you want to start with reading the state's laws on this matter? Or would you prefer to begin with something that maybe explains what the laws mean? Um, so kind of giving them some options of what sort of direction they can take. Um, and then, you know, what we're trying to avoid doing here is giving legal advice and giving legal interpretations. And we'll talk more about why we want to avoid doing that here in the next couple of slides. And so, what, how do we do this then? What is the path that we're going to take? So, first we want to begin by asking open-ended questions to, to determine what it is that the patron is looking for. Um, so this is going to more or less help us determine the subject area. But it might also help us determine what kinds of documents do they need as well. Do they need to look at the laws themselves, or do they actually just need divorce forms? Um, do they want to read up on eviction laws? Are they trying to write their own will? Um, at this point, it's also useful if you can determine any kind of deadline that they might be working under, what they already know, and if they're representing themselves in the matter, are they working with an attorney, or is this just something of casual interest that they're curious about. Um, then next, you want to try and figure out what jurisdiction this matter might be taking place in. A lot of times, the subject area can help you figure this out. Um, you know, as we talked about before, by and large, a lot of the questions that we field in the library tend to be matters of state jurisdiction. So this, again, is our things like divorce, child custody, landlord, tenant, estate plans, probate. But we might get those um, questions that are really about federal matters. So I think immigration was brought up in the chat, bankruptcy, employment discrimination, disability rights. Um, but then, you know, you may also hear some local questions, and so these might be things relating to building code questions or neighborly disputes. Um, you know, if you start searching in the wrong jurisdiction, usually you're not going to find a whole lot. Um, so that could then be your clue that maybe you need to start looking in other jurisdictions. And then every now and again, um, there are some issues that involve multiple jurisdictions. Um, so recently, I had a patron who was researching Medicare laws. And so this is a federally funded program that's run by the individual states. Um, so you have overriding federal statutes and regulations, but then there are also state statutes and regulations and how the program gets administrated. So, you know, there aren't too many of those areas, but Medicare is one that you may encounter, um, you know, in the library where people have questions about that particular program. So just kind of keep in mind that there may be multiple places you have to look for that one. Then after we've figured out what it is we're looking for and where we're going to look, then we want to come up with a list of keywords to search with. And sometimes it's pretty straightforward, but other times less so. Um, and you want to keep in mind that legal terminology can sometimes differ greatly from natural language. So generating synonyms can be helpful. Broader and narrower terms can also be helpful. Um, if you have access to a legal dictionary or can go online to find you know, a legal encyclopedia or something like that, that can also help you to get the right vocabulary. And you also want to keep in mind that patrons may not always use the correct legal terminology in describing things. So again, if it seems like you're hitting a dead end, that's a good time to kind of step back and maybe revise your terms a little bit. So one example is, you know, in the state statutes, um, they use the term motor vehicles. Um, so if you start looking under automobiles or cars, you're not going to find anything. You need to be using the term motor vehicles. Um, if you're lucky enough to have a print resource, generally if you're using the index, there'll be really good C also references, so it will point you to the right term. But if you're online, you might have to do a little more of that work on your own. And then the last um, thing that you'll do here in this process is sort of after you've gotten your subject area, you've gotten your list of terms to begin searching, you know where you're going to look. Um, then you can assist the patron in locating possible uh, relevant sources and then instructing them in how to search those sources if they need that kind of help. And so it might be showing them, you know, how to evaluate a website to make sure they're looking at an official government website, for example, um, and, you know, how to navigate that particular website, how to print things out. Um, if it's in a database, again, how to view records, how to print or save things from the database. Or if it's a print tool, 
Um, you may want to demonstrate how using an index works and then how to actually find, you know, the, the three-part number that they found, how to actually find that in the book itself. Um, it's always best to not assume that people are familiar with working with an index or a table of contents. Um, and so sometimes just a little bit of instruction can go a long way in saving that patron a lot of time um, so then they know how to navigate the book or the resource on their own. <clears throat> so then there are a few things we want to be aware of when providing legal reference services. The first is this area of the unauthorized practice of law. So most states do not allow people who are not licensed attorneys to give out legal advice or to practice law without a license. No librarian has ever been charged with this as a crime, and I think most people are well aware that a librarian is not the same as their attorney. But it's still just something that you want to have in the back of your mind so you can protect yourself, the library, as well as the patron. Um, you know, since we are not legal experts, we don't want to provide information that may harm the patron. And I find it's better to tell the patron when I don't know something and then refer them to a legal clinic um, so then they can get more in-depth information from someone who actually is a legal expert and then offer for them to return once they know more about their legal matter, then I can do a better job of helping them to find what they need. Um, the stakes can be pretty high for patrons who are representing themselves, so I think this is why it's important for us not to offer legal advice or interpretations. Um, and it may be worth considering creating a policy for legal reference services that outlines what staff can and cannot do with regard to legal reference questions. Most law libraries have policies posted on their websites, um, and I have a screenshot here on the next two slides of our legal reference policy for the Pikes Peak Library District just so you can kind of see what one might look like. And so here is ours. Hopefully you can read it. I know the print is probably a little small. But the top section is just sort of describing what is in our law collection that we have. And then under that procedures section, it actually references the law um, that prohibits staff from offering legal advice. So it kind of backs staff up. And if you have an insistent patron, you know, they can point to this and say, well, it's actually against the law for me to do what you're asking me to do. And then under guidelines, here's where you're going to get a clear picture of what the staff is able to do and what they're not able to do. And so in section A, it lists the various types of legal information and re research assistance that library staff can provide. And then in section B, it outlines the stuff that we're unable to do, like fill out forms or complete legal paperwork for people. We can't recommend specific forms, give advice or interpretations, et cetera. Um, we want to remind ourselves that we're experts in finding information. We are not experts in the subject area itself. Um, and it creates a liability to take on that duty of attempting to solve a patron's legal problem. I think there's a tension, though, between our professional responsibility to provide zealous reference services and making sure we don't cross that line into, ter inter into interpreting sources or providing legal advice. Um, with legal reference, I feel like greater responsibility falls on the patron to figure out the answer, and we're providing access to those resources. So understanding the difference between legal information and legal advice is important to avoiding the unauthorized practice of law, as well as some other concerns when providing legal reference services. Um, you know, on this chart, everything seems to be divided, you know, very neatly, but sometimes in the real world, that line will feel a little bit more murky. But I just wanted to give you sort of a few examples to kind of illustrate this concept between information and advice. Um, that top line is fairly important since a lot of us, you know, will encounter patrons who are looking for legal forms. Um, and so it's fine to show patrons where they can find forms as well as instructions for forms, but we don't want to recommend specific forms or help, form, help patrons fill out those forms. You always want the patron to make the choice of the forms. Um, if they're not sure about what forms they need, then this is a great time to refer them to a community resource like a law clinic, um, or there are a couple offices in the courthouse that can actually help people select the paperwork that they need. We'll talk about them more in detail later, but there's the self-represented litigant coordinators 
in the family court facilitators. And every um, judicial district has one of each of those offices in the state court building or their district court building. Um, other things on the chart, you know, again, we can make suggestions about what resources they may find the answer. We can locate items using a citation. Um, the advice, though, would be telling a patron, this is the law you need without that person providing a citation. And even if you're relatively confident about that this is the law that applies to their situation, I would generally defer from saying that because you never know if a patron has given you the full story in that reference interview. So there may have been key pieces of information that got left out. And so, um, you know, you can sort of guide them to the various sections where these laws get discussed, but it's really up to them to make those determinations about which specific laws apply to their situation. Um, then we can, you know, provide legal definitions, procedural definitions, but again, we're not going to do interpretations of those, you know, terms or interpretations of the law. We're not going to give them procedural advice. Um, and you can kind of see the delineation as you go down um, the rest of the chart. Um, that last line there, you know, um, again, it's good to provide general referrals if people are looking for representation. Um, the Colorado Bar Association has a great find a lawyer service on their website, um, but we don't want to recommend specific attorneys as well, just like we wouldn't recommend a specific doctor to somebody. Deborah, quick question yeah. for you. Would you mind if I made a PDF copy of this chart to post on the CSL in Session website oh, yeah. uh, to give That's as a reference? That would be great. Yeah, that would be wonderful if you could do that. Thank you. And then I just want to finish this last or this um, middle section here with just a couple of comments of things just to kind of keep in mind when working with um, patrons with legal questions. The first thing is that legal problems are complex. Um, and so they may not be solved with just one visit, particularly if someone's representing themselves in a court matter. That matter may take months, if not years, to resolve. Um, so that person may be coming back multiple times. Um, with that in mind, I always try to have the goal of moving the patron one step forward. Because I know I'm probably not going to be able to solve their problem in one visit. But if I can show them how to search the state statutes, if I can show them how to find legal clinics in the community or where they can find the legal forms they need, these are all tools that they need in solving their problem. So I've moved that person one step forward. So I consider that a successful interaction. Then also keep in mind, legal terminology is confusing. Patrons may not always use the correct term. So if you're hitting a dead end, this might be a good time to kind of step back and think about how else this can be described. Um, then don't take things personally. Um, going through the legal system is very stressful. Generally, um, you know, patrons may be threatened with the loss of status or property. They may be threatened with losing access to their children. So they might not be at their best when you encounter them. Um, and sometimes they might take that frustration out on you. It doesn't happen too often, but just, you know, kind of maintain a professional distance if that does occur. Because um, really it has nothing to do with you. It has to do with their whole world is sort of crashing down around them. And a lot of times when they're trying to work through the, ne the, the legal system, they're going to be encountering a lot of people that are be telling them, well, I actually can't answer that question for you. I'm not an attorney. I can't do this for you because I'm not an attorney. Um, so naturally, they're going to be frustrated. Um, so just remember that um, when you're working with folks. Um, that kind of leads into the next point, that listening can be a really important service that we provide. Obviously, you want to maintain some boundaries, right? Um, but Sometimes it's just helpful for people to have a friendly ear where they can sort of lay out what's happening to them. And I think giving them the time and the space to do that can help them to sort of think through what the problem is and what their approach may be. Um, so if you do have the time to actually listen to them, um, I think that really can make a world of difference for them. Um, again, we're not going to necessarily be able to solve their problem right then and there at the reference desk, but just having a kind person to listen can sometimes make them feel a lot better about their situation. 
Um, then again, we want to think in terms of sources, not specific answers. And then really, a lot of what I do is provide referrals. And that's something that libraries are already so great at. So just becoming familiar with where people can get help um, with legal questions in your community, that will help a lot of folks um, and really take some of the burden off of you um, to help the patron locate those answers. So knowing where they can go in the courthouse to have people help them select forms, knowing where legal clinics are in your general vicinity. These are two things that can really um, provide your patrons with a lot of assistance um, outside of the library's walls. OK, our last section's a little bit briefer. So um, I'm going to hopefully get through this and still have a little bit of time for questions at the end before we wrap up here. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about um, finding forms, because that's a big one. Um, that people come in looking for, and then where to look for clinics in your area, because it's going to be a little bit different depending on the size of the community you live in um, and what sort of resources that are there. Um, <clears throat> if you already kind of know where um, you look for forms already, go ahead and feel free to pop that in the chat. And we're going to talk a little bit, though, about where you can find some of those court forms. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so um, for forms, if it's um, for something that they're actually going to be filing at the court, so like divorce forms, for example, or small claims, or they're trying to get someone evicted, um, generally I would start for the court website for the jurisdiction that you're working in. Um, so generally you're going to find a section on these court websites with something titled forms or self-help. Um, if you're in Colorado, you're in luck because we live in a state where the, um, the entire state court system uses what are called unified court forms. So you just need to go to the Colorado Judicial Branch website, and all of the forms on there are going to work in any court in Colorado. Um, so that's really nice, because it's not like that in all states. Um, so if you are on the Colorado Judicial Branch website, look along the top banner, and there'll be a self-help form section. And in there, you're going to be able to find every, um, every kind of form that would be filed at the court. Um, if you do have some of those federal questions, though, if you go to the U.S. Courts website, um, they will have some forms available there. Um, and they actually have some really good secondary source type materials that explain bankruptcy and all the procedures for the different kinds of bankruptcy. Um, so that's a good place to look if you ever encounter that. Um, then, as I mentioned before, in Colorado, we also have two types of offices that can assist self-represented litigant with paperwork questions. And each state court or each district court is going to have one of these offices. And so they're manned by court employees. They're not attorneys in there. So again, they can't give legal advice. But what they do have the authority to do is to tell patrons, this is the form you need for that kind of action. Um, and they can also answer procedural questions for forms. So they can do a little bit more than what we can do. Um, so the first one to be aware of is the self-represented litigant coordinators. They can help with any kind of civil matter. The other office is called the Family Court Facilitators, and they only work on domestic issues like divorce and custody. And with divorce, they do both pre-decree and post-decree. So before the divorce and after the divorce, they can help with all of those kinds of issues. Um, if you are in Colorado, I would encourage you to reach out to one or both of those offices. Um, generally, libraries are going to offer much cheaper printing of forms than the courts will. Um, and so you can establish a relationship so they can refer people to you when folks, you know, need that cheaper printing. Um, or you can refer folks to them and you'll know the best way then to refer folks to their offices. Their offices are fairly high volume. Um, so generally it's kind of, it's good to know, do they just prefer walk-ins? Do they do emails? Some of them will take phone calls. Um, so it's kind of good to set up that relationship ahead of time. And the self-represented litigant coordinators or the family court facilitators, they may also offer other services. Um, so in El Paso County, our um, self-represented litigant coordinators have legal clinics that happen in their offices um, several times a week. They also have volunteers from TESA, which is a domestic violence organization here, that are there in the mornings to help people fill out protection orders. So there might be a lot of good things going on in those offices that you can refer patrons to. Um, then not every single type of form or legal document 
that a patron is going to need will necessarily be on the court's website though. So for legal documents that aren't filed with the court, you may want to look into a subscription database of some kind. I've listed two there. I'm pretty sure there's other ones out there. The one we subscribe to is that one on the top, Gale Legal Forms. And here you're going to find a lot of different resources for things like sample lease agreements, estate planning documents. Um, generally, these databases are not cheap, um, but however, the cost per form for the library is going to be substantially cheaper than what a patron would pay if they were purchasing forms from one of these services off of the web. Um, and then lastly, you may encounter forms that aren't necessarily on the court's website, and they're not in one of these databases either. Um, the court rules would be another place to look for these kinds of forms, especially if you see something like CRCP Rule 56. So that code CRCP tells me that's found in the Colorado Rules of Civil Procedure. Um, sometimes you'll find these kinds of forms also in continuing legal education materials. That's what the CLE is down there. Or the Colorado Practice Series might have that as well. Um, a lot of public libraries aren't going to carry those sources. So again, if you're encountering something like that, that's a great time to refer someone to a law library to see if they have those materials. And the last thing I just want to say about forms, I don't have it on the slide here, but there are legal forms that don't look like a form. So generally, I think when people envision a form, it's a sheet of paper and it has these empty boxes and they just fill in the information that the box asked for. But a legal form can also just be a document template. And so it will just tell you the sections that you need to have and the order they should be in. So the person actually has to sit down and write it. Generally, people don't like it when I tell them that's what the form is telling them. Um, but just be aware that that could happen. You could encounter a form that looked like that. OK, uh, then clinics. So um, another great way to assist your patrons is to really be familiar with any free and low cost legal services in your area. Um, if you are aware of any legal clinics in your area, go ahead and just raise your hand um, if you wish uh, on the, the, the webinar interface there. But having a list of free legal clinics available can just be an easy way to assist patrons. Um, so he, there are just a few suggestions on this slide of places to look for clinics. Um, so again, check with those offices in the courthouse, the self-represented litigant coordinators and the family court facilitators, because chances are they may be referring people to clinics too. So they may already have a list or a calendar that you can just get a copy of, um, and that's going to save you a lot of work and having to track everything down. There's also a program in Colorado called the Virtual Pro Se Clinics. Um, and so this is sort of a... Um, uh, it happens in public libraries all around the state. Um, I think there are 41 participating uh, public libraries in this program now. So essentially you set up a video chat and then people can talk with an attorney for free. Um, then Colorado Legal Services. This is going to be another agency that might provide clinics in your area. They may also provide pro bono representation um, for people who meet their income requirements and have the right types of cases. Um, you also might want to check with your local bar association. Um, and so you can generally find all of the local bar associations on the Colorado Bar Association website, um, or just search your county or city name and bar association to see if you have one. Um, but they may provide clinics or pro bono or modest means uh, representation for people who qualify. Then lastly, you might check with other service providers. So who else is providing community help? They may also provide legal help as well. And so Catholic Charities, they do um, some immigration uh, issues. So they have attorneys that work on that. Some senior service organizations may also offer legal help um, to folks who qualify. Um, generally, of course, they have to be in that age group. I would check with uh, work, groups that work with veterans. Uh, a number of them will provide low cost or free legal assistance. And then services that work with domestic violence victims. A lot of them will have some sort of legal counsel um, that people can work with. And so those are all um, other places to look. And then lastly, you probably also want to think about where your closest uh, local law library is. Um, law libraries that take public funding have a mission to serve the public. Uh, and so in the state of Colorado, 
we have uh, four law libraries that are open to the public. Unfortunately, they're all kind of consolidated in the front range area, but many of them can offer limited remote services as well. And so there's the library that I work for, Pikes Peak Library District in Colorado Springs. Our downtown location has a legal research collection, and I'm happy to take referrals, so please feel free to reach out to me. If I can't find it, then um, we can look at maybe where else uh, the item might be. And then in Denver, we have the Colorado Supreme Court Law Library, and then the Federal Court, the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals, has a law library that's also open to the public. And then lastly, um, CU Law Library, um, their, their um, campus in Boulder, their, that law library there can also um, help the public. And they have a great email reference services. And so occasionally when I've been having trouble kind of navigating a question or you know, wanting to know if they have a particular resource that a patron is looking for, you can just use that email service and it's a great way to get in touch with them. Um, I think most of them, uh, us are from Colorado, but if you're from another state, then here are just a few other places to look um, for law libraries. Now with law schools, public universities generally will have a law library open to the public. If it's a private institution, it could go one way or the other. It just sort of depends. Um, all right. So I'm really reaching kind of the end of my time. I'm sorry I talked for most of this. Um, hopefully we got most of the questions answered. The last few slides are just kind of a brief overview of what we covered. So I'm just going to scroll through these really quick. But if you do have, um, you know, more questions, please pop them in the chat. And Christine will help me here if I've missed any of the ones that have shown up. Um, I don't think I saw any questions that we didn't um, get answered. Uh, a couple of the attendees uh, listed some of the legal services and legal information that they provide. Um, so if you do have any additional questions, feel free to put them in the chat area. Um, we have um, Deb Hamilton's email on the slide. Um, and then, um, so I can leave Deb's uh, email address on the slide um, in the chat. Um, I put a link to the CSL in session website. Um, so later this afternoon, hopefully actually within about an hour, the archive should be available. So where it says CSL in session, CVL sites, and it links to the past classes um, will be there. And also the next link that I put in there is a chat to the, um, a survey that we would love to have you fill out on today's session. Um, and you can just click right on any of those links that are in the chat to open it up. Um, and I am seeing uh, Deidre has a quick question. Okay, yeah, so finding those older municipal codes, um, a couple places to start looking. Um, if the city maintains any sort of city archives, that's generally probably where those older codes are going to be held. Um, you can also maybe contact the city clerk. Uh, generally, that would be the office in charge of producing those um, city codes. Um, so they may also maintain the older versions. Um, and then you may also um, check with DPL. I know they have um, sort of an archives there as well. They may have those documents there, but I would probably first start to make sure there's not a separate city archive or check with the clerk first, because that's generally where those older codes get housed. So I hope that helps. All right, and I see that Deidre is responding. Well, thanks um, to everyone who attended today, and I want to send a special thanks to Deb Hamilton and the Colorado Association of Law Libraries. As was mentioned at the beginning, this is just the first of three um, uh, sessions on helping patrons with legal questions. Um, the next one will be on March 27th um, at noon Colorado time where we will discuss researching state and local laws and the third, third session will be on April 25th when we will discuss federal laws and secondary sources. Um, we also have a webinar on March 14th um, from the Denver Public Library. They are going to kick off a four-part series on supporting developing readers at the library. So completely different audience but um, hopefully you all got something out of today's session. If you do have a chance to fill out the survey please do so and I will go ahead and uh, thank Deb once again for all of her insight and information and wish everybody a great afternoon. Great, thank you everyone for coming and thank you Christine and the State Library for hosting this. This was great to be able to connect with you all.